Hey everyone, it's seven o'clock Eastern time on the East Coast of America. And hopefully you can all hear me. I always like to test it and just ask some people if you wouldn't mind just throwing a chat and say, hi, I can hear you. Just anybody. The other thing I'd like to say is, let's see now. There is something else going on here. Loud and clear, says Marilyn. That's great. Super. I'm so glad because I, I think I have one other switch that I'm supposed to throw here. Ah, there it is. Built in microphone. Uh, okay. Okay, so <clears throat> let's get into this. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to warn you right up front that the beginning of this is a little slow. And the reason it's a little slow is because I want some time for people to get here. Everyone's always late. That's just the nature of people. Um, and I also want to um, start off slow because this is a really simple process, but it needs to be built on a little bit of a foundation. And then once I get the foundation going, I'm going to pick up the pace. And as I pick up the pace, um, it's all going to make sense, especially if you hang in there and wait to the end. So if you have questions, you don't know if what's going on, uh, just bear with me. It's all going to make sense because it's all so simple. Um, the other thing is uh, we're down a member. Uh, my son is away right now, so it's just my wife on the other side here, and she's going to try and keep up with all your chats and questions. But if you could be just patient, she's going to get these questions and then text them to me and let me know, wave things, throw napkins at me or something. Um, but it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, but I'm pretty passionate about this. Oh, who am I? I'm Jeff Tucker. Everyone calls me Doc T. I'm a veterinarian. And this is a presentation of uh, the, my horse talk series on the horse's advocate. Uh, horse talk is something I started back in the early, uh, the late 90s. I put together something called Horse Talk Tapes. I sold them in that new magazine called Equus. Um, and they're a real hit, uh, but they're cassettes. This is long before we had anything digital. So my Horse Talk series has been around for quite a while. Um, and I've just kind of resurrected it here on the Horses Advocate. And I talk about everything that just helps people become advocates for their horse. Uh, it's a part of the equine practice. I like to simplify things. I like to make things so simple that you can latch on to it because I believe knowledge is power. And if you understand some of the basic concepts, you're able to really move forward and get a lot of things done. You can always go to the horsesadvocate.com, just like that um, uh, address says right there on the top, thehorsesadvocate.com, and you can find horse talk there. And uh, I'm going to be archiving all these webinars on the site. Uh, but there's the recording of this webinar will be f uh, available for free for everyone uh, for the next month. So if you if you're missing it, uh, you can see it there. Okay, why do I want to talk about horsemanship? It's because I like to make things simple. I like to make it clear because when you become clear on horsemanship, you can learn how to communicate better with your horses. And when you communicate better, it keeps you safe, and more importantly, it makes working with the horses fun. And that's really important because a lot of people get frustrated with their horses because they, they can't seem to communicate. It's more of a fight. It's more of a battle instead of a cooperation between two individuals. And that's what I want to peel apart tonight. Allow you to learn to look at your horse in a different way and learn how to connect with them. And once you learn how to connect with them, oh my gosh, it's so much more fun working with horses. I've been with horses since 1983. Um, there it is, since 1973 and been a vet since 1984. And my other horses um, uh, I've seen have, uh, have not changed. The, the way a horse communicates hasn't changed since the beginning of time. However, what we've done has changed or is, is the way we changed our communication skills. And, and, and the reason is because uh, we're getting really good at texting people but not really talking to people. All right, that's a little bit about me. Let's talk about a word I, I developed called complexicating. And people complexicate horsemanship. Complexicate is a made up word. You aren't, aren't going to find it in the dictionary. Uh, but it means to make something that is simple more complicated than it needs to be. 
And I know a lot of you out there are kind of laughing because we tend to do that with horses, especially when we don't understand something. We try to overanalyze it and peel it apart and make things uh, more complicated than it needs to be. And you're going to see that as we go through here. But if we're going to talk about horsemanship in one word, it's analogous to leadership. And I put together this term called horsemanship is leadership. And if for some reason you get booted off the internet and you disconnect and, and, and you never find me again, let me tell you right now, if you want to become a good horseman, read everything you can on leadership and people because it is absolutely the same. But here's the crux. Most people are poor leaders and have poor relationships with their spouses, their siblings, their parents, and even strangers. So if they have these poor relationships with these people, how on earth can they be good leaders of horses? And you find that what a lot of people do, especially people who don't like other people or don't get along well with people or don't like to lead other people, they like horses because they become the good leader with a horse. They just not seem to be afraid of them, I guess. All right, so why has horsemanship become so complicated? Well, about 100 years ago, everybody had some degree of horsemanship. To be an officer in the Army in World War I, you had to be a horseman because they still were used to carry our leaders, the equipment, and supplies into battle. But as cars became available, keys were picked up, the reins were dropped, and horsemanship virtually disappeared. As people discovered horses as recreation competition that was more than just racing, uh, more and more people became involved. There are really... Um, there were few real horsemen able and willing to teach it because there was no market for it. Back in the 60s, nobody knew how to reach people. There were some books out there on how to, to become a good horseman, but most horse owners didn't read them. Most of the horsemen that were out there were still on the racetrack or still working as cowboys. But after the secretary won the Triple Crown in 1973, racing started to fall out of favor. New horse owners looked with disdain on their style of horsemanship. Americans started to look at the cowboy as a quintessential horseman, and several cowboys started to train others, mostly to preserve what they knew. In the mid to late 1990s, several uh, cowboys looked at teaching horsemanship as a marketable business. Names and styles were branded. As long as there was a cowboy hat, and possibly if they talked without, a city, without that city way, they were looked on as being authentic and a trusted source of information. Some added scientific evidence to their working theories. Many came up with unproven theories that sounded good. There was success because they offered a structure that seemed to work where no structure actually existed. But in my opinion, all of these methods just complicated what we as humans already knew in dealing with other people. The problem is that we now communicate more efficiently using electronic means. That includes texting, telephone, um, television, all these electronic means, emails, but we don't necessarily communicate more effectively. And communication is a lot more than words. Communication is energy. Okay, not that energy stuff. I mean, I want to know how to say things that make the horse do what I want him to do. And that kind of um, thought process is what is wrong with us between our own friends, our own family, and certainly with our horses. We try to make the horse do what we want. And I've got to tell you, it never works. Look at your relationship with your parents, with your husband or wife, or even the auto mechanic working in a car. As you start to tell them what you want, tell me how well that works for you. It usually works well in a, a situation where you're paying the person, but it doesn't work well with family. And I'll bet Unless you're a dictator or a mob boss, it's not working well for you. The best most of you do is offer treats as a reward or an enticement for their behavior. Okay, so let's agree to hang around and listen to what I have to say. I will tell you that my wife purchased four different horsemanship programs and thoroughly listened to them, watched them, and read them all. She spent weeks, if not months, on them. Her conclusion was this. They all said same, the same thing, but in different ways. She could pick something from all of them. So stick around and pick something uh, from what I'm going to give you tonight. And I promise you, <clears throat> though what I say is simple enough that everyone can do it without gimmicks or, or, or fancy equipment. Oh, and I might want to tell you, 
um, I've never read any of the books or watched any of the videos or talked to anybody about the other styles of horsemanship. Everything I'm going to give you tonight is something that I've done because I've worked with tens of thousands of horses, different horses, and there's no better teacher. And I got to be honest with you, in the first couple of decades working with horses, I was not that effective. It's only been in the past five to 10 years that I've really started to put this thing together and made sense of it all. So I wrote a book called The 10 Irrefutable Laws of Horsemanship. And it's a very thin book. It's about 40 pages, fits in your back pocket. And if you want it, uh, you can go to uh, the websites that are on the end of this uh, webinar. Basically, if you go to theequinepractice.com, which is my home base, and go to the store, you're going to find this book listed there. And you know, Download it, iTunes. Uh, you can download it in other electronic formats, uh, and you can purchase the book itself. But I want to go over the 10 irrefutable laws because this is what works. It works for me day in and day out. There are two parts to this. There's the physical connection, which are laws 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then there's the mental connection, and that's laws 5 through 10. Before I get into this, I just want to thank you for being here and buckle up because I'd like to go through this relatively quickly. I can't get it all done at once because it's something you have to practice and you have to memorize. But once you get the basics done and you repeat these over and over again with as many different horses as possible, it's all going to make sense. And what's really, really cool about this is everything I'm going to teach you tonight, you can try out on your spouse, on the next guy at the convenience store, uh, as the person drives down I-95 uh, or your local interstate, wherever you are, and, and, and uh, acts like a jerk. All of this stuff will suddenly make sense because you'd be able to practice it everywhere. All right, let's get started. Law number one, a horse can seriously hurt you and even kill you. Now, a lot of people sit here and think, oh, that's not true. But there's many of you out there who have been hurt, or maybe you've known somebody who's died. My original mentor, my original veterinarian who actually helped me become uh, geared up to become a veterinarian, he was a great man. And he worked all of his life as a veterinarian, worked out in Kentucky, was world-renowned as a breeding expert for thoroughbreds. And he retired and came back to New York to settle down and just have some fun with horses. And he was helping um, uh, one of his colleagues at a breeding farm work on a stallion. And he was knocked down and his head split open and it was dead in two days. And it, it tears me apart to think that somebody who's been working on horses that long can still suddenly have a mistake made and die from it. So please understand that a horse can seriously hurt you and even kill you. Now, law two is a horse that will kill you or hurt you is your own. As depicted in this picture here, the girl is holding onto the horse with no connection. The horse seems like uh, they have a connection, but in reality, he didn't. The horse is, the, the person is breaking the first four laws of, of my 10 irrefutable laws. The first is she doesn't acknowledge that this horse can kill her. Second is she doesn't have a lead rope on. And third is she's put herself in the back corner. Which brings me to law three. <clears throat> Always use a, a halter and lead rope when working with a horse. And I really am not going to be interested in, in what anybody says here. If you can put a halter on a horse and the lead rope, you're going to have a physical connection. And once you have that physical connection, you can use that to actually amplify your mental connection. It's really good. If you've got the horse's head, you've got control of the horse. If you don't have the head, you don't have control of the horse. And if you don't have control of the horse, then you're not going to be effective in getting the things that you have to get done with the horse. I see so many people walk in the stall, oh, I'm just going to adjust the blanket, or I'm just going to pop something, you know, uh, unwrap the leg or wrap a leg or do something like that, and they don't have any connection with the horse. And many, many times that works. But there's going to be one time where the horse suddenly just moves. And the horse may inadvertently hurt you, but the bottom line is you're still hurt. And what's even more important, and I want all of you adults to understand this, there's children always watching you. And you may be seasoned horse person, 
but you're teaching that youngster how to work on a horse in an unsafe manner. And when that little girl or little guy gets hurt by their horse because they didn't have a halter on the horse, then you're the one who's responsible for that injury. So it's good that you set the example and set the pace for all those who are working around you, especially if you have children around you. And law four is always place yourself between the horse and the exit. This is a little drawing I have over here. Kath, can you see my cursor over there? Yes. Okay. So X is you, and here's the exit in the blue line. And this is the stall or the paddock. This is the position where the horse should always be, and the horse needs to be, or you need to be between the horse and the exit. This is a good uh, situation. It's this position where you can control the movement of the horse, and it also includes the paddock. Uh, or, or turnout. This could be a 50 acre field and you just brought the horse in, always turn the horse around so you're connected. This is the opposite. Here you're on the other side of the horse and the two things can happen. First, the horse can leave. He can just scoot right out the exit and be gone. And second, he can just kick you right like that. And many people have been kicked. Even I've been kicked way, way back because I got behind a horse, the horse just thought it'd be cute to pop me in the, in the front of the thigh. Luckily, it didn't hurt, um, I didn't die, but uh, I've known people have been um, uh, hurt and even killed this way. So never get between the horse, or never let the horse get between you and the exit. Let me go back to this. One of the things that I like to, to note is, when you come into the paddock, turn the horse around and have him face you. Wait till the horse's energy drops to be, being very calm and then let go of the horse. And always, always walk away from the horse first. Never let the horse walk away from you. It's disrespectful. If you've brought the horse and put it in a position, a true leader will say, okay, we're going to wait till you're calm and then I'm going to turn and walk away from you. You don't turn right and walk, from, walk away from me. I need a little sip of water. Hold on. Okay, as far as I'm concerned, everything up to this point is the boring point. And you're probably yawning and stretching and wondering what the heck you signed up for this thing. Because all these things, for me, just make sense. The next uh, six laws are where the meat and potatoes are. This is where the excitement comes. This is where I'm going to be thinking differently. This is how I've worked with horses all my life. And this is what makes a difference. And I'm going to go over all of this. Um, as far as how I use it in my practice. So I'll give you some really good examples. But law five is become the leader. This is the first of the mental connection laws. It's it, in every herd, there's always a leader and you're included in that herd. This is where a lot of people don't understand. They think the horse is the horse and you're the people. And because you're the person, you've automatically earned the right to be the leader. But as far as the horse is concerned, every herd has a leader and the herd includes the horse and the human and if you have more than one horse that makes it even better because then there's more dynamics and it's really cool to watch it but not all horses are good leaders and if you won't become the good leader of the herd you're going to have chaos you're going to have anarchy anarchy is a fancy word that means no leader there's no leader helping out and without leadership you have um unrest and you have upset horses so number uh the first thing you do is law five become the leader i'm going to show you how to do that if you or one of the horse one of the horses is a good leader then there will be peace in the barn you cannot both be the leader because the rules of leader will always apply so it's always a good idea that you're the leader now if you or one of the horse is a bad leader then there will be unrest in the barn as the leadership is questioned. This is true if you're talking about a football team and the coach is not uh, trusted, or if you talk about any team, uh, whether it's your team at work uh, or sports team, or in this case, your barn. If the leader is a bad leader, if he's a dictator, if he's a beater of the horse, if he doesn't have direction, then the horses are not going to be led, and you're going to see this. Melissa and I walk into horse and stalls all the time in barns, and we can tell when there's no leadership. And then we can also tell if there is leadership, because in a barn with leadership, the horses are always calm. Now, if more than one horse wants to be the leader, and you're not the leader, 
then there's going to be fighting going on. That's where horses are kicking each other and they're throwing their heads and baring their teeth and pinning the ears back and everyone's just making a big fuss. So you need to become the leader. Now, and leadership can come naturally. It's kind of like singing. But leaders can also be developed in those willing to become a leader. Let me give you an example. If I gave a 1,000 of you the same song to sing, let's just say happy birthday, 900 of you, I'm going to ask you to stay in the shower. Don't sing in public. You can't carry a tune. You're awful at it. Not all humans are good leaders. But if I took you, and especially the top 100 out of 1,000, and trained you, and gave you all the tools necessary to become a good leader, you can improve to the point where you could be singing at the local bar or in the church choir. And maybe some of you can actually go on one of these reality shows and be picked as a winner and get yourself a recording contract. So leadership is like singing. You, we can be trained and work at it a little bit better. One of the objectives of leadership is to empower those around you to do things you want for the good of all, and to have them do this willingly while expanding and growing their abilities. The secret to effective leadership are in the next five laws, and so I've just about opened the door for you. But let me go over that objective one more time. A good leader takes the people around them, or in this case, the horses around them, and they raise those horses to a higher level that they want to be at. See, everyone's lazy. And everybody would rather just kick around, not shave, not shower, wear sloppy clothes, and kind of just go blah. That's normal. But a leader will inspire the people around them to do more, to energize themselves, to become better than they are alone. That's what a leader does, and that's what you're going to do with your horses. In horsemanship dentistry, we have about 30 seconds to connect with horses we work with. We don't have 30 minutes, and we don't have 30 days. And most of you listening to this know that that's what I do for a living. As a veterinarian, all I do is horsemanship dentistry, which means I don't automatically drug the horses. I don't hang their head or immobilize them, and I don't jack their mouth open. And I can connect with most horses. In fact, I can connect with 96 horses out of every 100. That's 96% of the horses I see. And I see thousands of horses year after year, and most of them have pain inside the horse's mouth. Yet 96% of them, will allow me to go ahead and work without having to give them drugs because I take the time and I become effective in the leader and these horses, I'm empowering them to become better than what they normally are and they usually stand and give and help because they understand that I'm trying to help them. Okay. Let's talk about the personalities of the horses. This is law six. Now we're going to get into the meat and potatoes. I've asked you to become the leader. I've asked you to realize that a horse can kill you, that the horse will kill you as your own, that to have good uh, mental connection, you need a good physical connection, and always keep yourself in a safe spot because you can't trust any horse. Any horse out there, whether intentionally or by accident, can hurt you. So you must set yourself up for success. All right? Then as a, as a leader, you need to empower those around you. But how do you do that? This is what Law 6 starts, starts off as. There's a guy named Socrates a long, long time ago. And he explained that the four basic personalities of humans are from the four different um, uh, fluids of the body. And I'll, and I'll tell you what they are. I believe this is why, okay. <laughs> I've discovered that horses have the same personalities as humans. And that's why I think we love horses so much because we can actually get a connection with a horse. And that's why we love them so much. It's not when the horse dies, we're missing the body. We miss the connection that that horse has with us. And all of you who've lost a horse, I know we've lost many ourselves. We look back and we say, do we have a strong connection with this horse or don't we? And those we have the strongest connection with are the ones that t- tend to tear us apart the most. The four personalities are Latin words that have been changed into more logical words to help horse, horse owners. For example, uh, they've changed it to the word introvert or left brain or zone one or type A. And these are all people who are trying to make this a simpler um, concept. But I use the original words because they're so distinctive once they're learned. And he derived uh, derived them, Socrates derived them from phlegm, urine, manure, and blood. And for some reason, that works for me. So hang in there. 
let's go over these. Sanguine. These sanguine personalities are the life of the party. They love attention. They love the spotlight. They're fun to be around. They make friends easily. They're energetic, emotional. They love people, and they're charming. These horses like fun. However, what they think is fun and what you think is fun may be polar opposites, kind of like bungee jumping. Some of us like to do it. Some of us will never do it, even if they paid us a million dollars. Sanguine horses also overreact to things. They are emotional roller coasters. They will focus on you intently. Then in a moment, they will focus on something else, such as a horse walking by. Some have short attention spans. They might be considered or joked at as having ADD or ADHD. These are human diseases which have an uncertain cause. They also cross into any personality type. But with sanguine horses, they may just show more attention deficits than the other personality types. So you have to be kind of on your toes and always connected with a sanguine horse. The second personality is called choleric. They're demanding, dominant, strong-willed, independent, confident, goal-oriented, good under pressure, loves competition. Choleric horses are very dominant. Not all stallions are choleric, but high testosterone levels can bring about bully activity, which is often confused with the choleric personality. Mares with canines. Remember, mares are not supposed to have canines. Only the boys have them. So when the girls have canines, they also have a higher level of testosterone, and they can be assertive and dominant. Both stallions and mares with canines are easy to work with because they are confident and love to communicate. But cleric horses are not always good leaders. Keep in mind that cleric horses are trying to establish communication with you, not the other way around. What makes these horses so dangerous is that cleric, is the cleric motto, quote, I can't stand stupid people. And I know you know people like this. If you don't respond instantly to these dominant personalities, they will assume that you're just another dumb human not listening. Communication ends before it had a chance to begin. If you don't immediately acknowledge a cleric, what makes this dangerous is that their dismissal of you can be quick and in no uncertain terms. I personally love clerics because once they understand that you're listening, they're all ears. They're such good communicators. If you show fear or lack of leadership skills or just unfair, they will dismiss you promptly. You will have lost the chance to be a leader and the horse will run roughshod over you. If you are confident and, more, and most importantly, fair with your leadership abilities, then a clear course will become your best and faithful friend. All right, the third personality is called a melancholy. These guys are organized, orderly, thinkers, analytical, artistic, perfectionists, need to complete things, avoids attention, they're faithful, and they're compassionate. As with choleric horses, you need to earn the respect of these melancholy horses. However, this is done differently. With a cleric, you just need confidence in yourself. But with a melancholy, you need to build the confidence in the horse. It is the difference in winning and losing the leadership position with a melancholy horse. Just for a second, I hope I don't confuse you, I want to go back to clerics. I often ask my clients a simple question, and, and I'm assuming a lot of you out there are women, at least from the sign-up list. So I'm going to ask you this. How do you make a man wear a pink fluffy shirt to a cocktail party? And the answer is very simple. You tell them how good looking they are in it. If you tell them, oh my goodness, you are just stunning, you're handsome, I, can't, I can barely keep my hands off of you, this guy's going to wear the pink fluffy shirt proudly to the cocktail party. That's how you treat a cleric horse. You make it their idea. But with a melancholy, you have to build up their confidence. You have to let them know that there's going to be a process, a plan, and you're going to stick to it. To work a melancholy horse is physically talk with a horse. Be over-talkative and very descriptive. We do this all the time uh, when we're floating. We'll be floating on the upper right side, and I'll say, okay, I'm going to switch over and do your left side. And you can almost see their eyes click in response, and you move the blade over. If you don't tell these horses and you move the blade over to the opposite side of the mouth, some of these horses overreact and just go backwards and say, hey, you, yo, what did you, you just changed. 
That's how melancholies are. They're the type who are going along the ride and everything's fine until a flock of birds takes off and they go down the checklist. Nope, I don't recall anywhere on this list of things to do that there would be a flock of birds. I'm going to run. That's what a melancholy does. You have to apply some discipline. And to define discipline, consider that anything used to break the state of a horse is discipline, while the release of that action is considered a reward. So when you have a horse that's going down the road and the flock of birds goes off, if you have a good connection, the first thing they do is they check in with you. And they say, what is this? What do I do? And you have to apply some discipline and say, you're going to stay and pay attention to me. And you have to break their state on what they're looking at and say, okay, now we're going to move over this direction. We're going to stay together. And then you release and they have the reward. That's how you work with a melancholy horse. Now, phlegmatics are an interesting lot. They're low-keyed, easygoing, doesn't get flustered, takes his time, peaceful. Everybody likes them. They balance, but they hide their emotions. The common name for a phlegmatic horse is bomb-proof. They are good at not saying what they really want. Rather, they are willing to do anything they are asked, such as have you float their teeth. It doesn't mean they like it. They rather just take it than complain. That's the phlegmatic. They're like wallflowers, but when rewarded, they will become alive and, more importantly, loyal. But phlegmatic horses are also uneasy with change. They like things to remain the same. Phlegmatic horses need to know that they're secure. They need reassurance when a stranger appears or something changes, but the unknowing person falsely reassures them by raising their energy and saying lies, and I'll tell you about that in a second. This is where law seven and eight that's coming up really helps these guys because phlegmatic horses, if they're pushed, will actually blow up. There's nothing worse than a horse is just standing there, looks like everything's going well, and then bam, and you're off and gone or kicked or hurt. So just to summarize in law six, the most important thing to know about the four personalities is that people and horses are made of a blend of the four personalities with usually one being dominant. Example, a cleric horse who thinks all people are dumb, but because he's predominantly phlegmatic, he just doesn't care. This horse goes along with the human as bomb-proof, or he's a bomb-proof horse until he's pushed too far and comes unglued, hurting people in the process. Okay, this is really cool. Now we're getting into how we connect. I first told you to become a leader, and I told you why you need to become a leader. And I told you that to become a leader, you have to understand the personalities of the people you're leading. Every teacher out there has uh, looked at their classroom and seen, you know, umpteen different faces and knows that they can't treat Johnny the same way they're going to treat Susie. Johnny may be the bully. Johnny needs to be a little bit more firm and disciplined and you have to show leadership and draw out of them, hit the Johnny's position of he wants to be the leader and show him how to do things. Whereas Susie may be more laid back, and Jane over there may need to know exactly the process, otherwise she's very unsure and she's afraid to take the next step. So the teacher is the leader, and the horses are like the students, and you have to identify what personalities you're working with in order to be effective with them. And this is where Law 7 comes in. Seek first to understand. And you'll see that there's dots after seek first understand because this is a continuation. It continue, continues in law eight, but let's not go there yet. That's then to be understood. But the first part of it is seek first understand. And listening is the first part of communication. And remember, there's no difference between not knowing a language and not listening. When you stop listening to the horse, it's when they become an inanimate object, no different than a car parked in your garage. To listen, you need to shut up and stop talking. Let me give you an idea. This is a great example of Law 7. Um, this isn't written here. But pretend you don't know Chinese, and you're sitting in a ballroom, and there's seven, I mean, there's a thousand people in this ballroom, and you're smack dab in the middle of it, and you have to go to the bathroom. I mean, your legs are crossed, you're about to cry, and you're going to say, you know what? I really don't care. I'm just going to let go of my bladder because I, I, I just don't know what to do. Now, you can't speak Chinese, and the Chinese can't speak English, and yet there's one person in this crowd who understands what you're trying to say. 
It's not words, but it's actions. And they come over and they take your hand and they guide you over to where the bathrooms are. Who now is your best friend? That's what it's, I'm talking about. You need to listen and understand what the person is trying to say. Because everyone has a story, including horses. And you do not have to listen to everybody's story. Listening without acknowledgement to a story often empowers them with bad behavior if you react to it. For instance, the last man or vet or person who entered my stall caused me pain. It was bad. Now, that's what the horse is saying. You know, as you walk in, the ears are back, they're cowering in the corner, says, the last man who entered my stall caused me pain. Now, it's important to glean this information, but it's equally important not to react to it other than to say, that must have made you feel bad. Now I know where you're coming from, seeing me, so we can now work together and find common ground. Now, that's a mouthful, but it's more of an, uh, a feeling that you give. You sit there and you just calm down and let the horse express himself. I don't like men. I don't like vets. You're in my stall. You're going to be bad news. That's his story. Don't acknowledge it. What most people tend to say is, really? Well, tell me about it. Tell me your story. Or, well, I'm not anything like them. I'll be different. You're only lying to them. It only leads to battle because they don't believe you. You're only trying to start a conversation and you haven't stopped and listened first and understand deeply what that horse is trying to say to you. Now, this is something that might work better as you start off with, with humans. If somebody around you says something bad or something that bothers you, and I'll give you an example in a little bit, you need to stop and understand what it is that they're trying to say. Okay, what most people do is they reward bad behavior. And this is something that is so critical. The horse tells a story and they reach in their pocket, they pull the treat out and they say, oh, they're there now. It's okay. Here, have a peppermint and come to me. They have rewarded their bad behavior. You think you're modifying their behavior. You think you're training them. All you're doing is you're making them come to you for food. You're not deep digging down deep and trying to understand why this horse is running away from you. This horse shouldn't run away from you. This horse should be upfront, should be a willing partner, should offer his hoof when you ask to pick it up, should load on the trailer, should do all the things that you want to do it. But they are trying to tell you something. And a lot of times, if you listen to my lecture last month about nutrition, uh, a lot of horses are just saying, I don't feel good. You're feeding me a bunch of grain. You've got my hind gut in a tizzy. Every time you put me on the trailer, every time you throw a girth on me, it hurts. I feel like vomiting. I feel awful. And you're going to do it again. So you're repeating the bad behavior. And then instead of dealing with what the cause is, you end up giving them some sort of act, you know, some sort of petty expressions like, oh, it's all right. I know how you feel. Come here. I'm going to take care of you. Don't worry about it. It'll be okay. It's fine. None of it's fine. You're not listening to the horse. The horse is going to continue to tell your story. So you must learn to acknowledge what is being said without accepting it. You, if you only accept it and not acknowledge it, then you've not listened and you have rewarded the bad behavior. Now, <clears throat> that's worth re repeating, so I'm going to do it right here. You must learn to acknowledge what is being said without accepting it. If you just accept it, then you have not listened and you have rewarded the bad behavior. Assume everything you say in a reactive way to when somebody has bad behavior is a lie. And I know you wouldn't like it. It's not the news. It's the way the news makes us feel. <gasps> did you see that car wreck? Okay, so that's sensationalized. But how did that car wreck make you feel? Have you had a car wreck? You know, you see it on TV. Have you had a car wreck? Can you empathize with what's going on there? Or what's actually going on in your mind? Why are you reacting so to that bit, bit of news? That's more deeper understanding of what's going on. So the secret is simple. Tell me how this makes you feel is what you should always be asking. You should really believe this when you say it. The bottom line is that the horse needs to believe that he has been honestly heard. Peel back the layers. This is where all conversation needs to start. It is where trust starts. Seeking first to understand those around you empowers you with leadership. Accepting this story by becoming part of their story ends your role as a leader. I know this is pretty complicated, but if you just review this 
or get the book and read this over and over again, you're going to get it. When somebody gives you a story or when a horse starts to give you a story, acknowledge that they're giving you a story, but don't accept it. As soon as you accept it and buy into the story, you've lost your leadership role. They're leading the dance, not you. Stop talking and listen, even if it's for just a moment. Remember, listening is not just hearing words. It is understanding their energy, their body movements, and the tone. It is also a process of reflecting back to the person or horse that you have heard so they feel understood. It is only at this point that you can open up a channel of communication where you can convey your thoughts and ideas back to them. In other words, if you're not listening, why on earth do you think they're going to listen to you? This brings us to law eight, then to be understood. So seek first to understand, then to be understood, and you must put them in that order. If you get your order out of whack and you go in and you start demanding what you want, then nobody's listening. And if you, nobody's listening, there's no communication. Okay. You need to select the form or style of communication based on the personality of the horse. Now, as with people, you need to use different ways of saying these things to different personalities. Same with horses. So let's look at this, a sanguine. You're going to make it fun. Congratulate abundantly, smile, laugh, but don't expect them to follow orders. You need to guide them gently. In other words, slap them on the side, let them know um, uh, that things are fine, um, laugh with them. If they goof up, tell them you goofed up, get over it, come on, let's go. They like to have fun. Now, on a cleric, always make it his idea. Use language that you are talking to a human. In other words, talk to them with words. Just because a horse can't speak your language doesn't mean they can't understand it. And I see horses that come in from all over Europe from different countries. And they're standing there with eyes bugged out and I want to get my float inside of them and start rubbing and filing on their teeth. And their eyes are bugged out and I say to them, good, good, or brav, or um, très bien, or something. Uh, some language that they know, even with a British accent if they're from England, and these horses instantly melt. You should see when it happens. It blows my mind. But they absolutely know the language that they're coming from, and a cleric really responds to that. Work together and allow him leadership in the task while offering confidence and guidance. Clerics love to be leaders themselves, but you, they don't need to be the leader but they can show their leadership in themselves. Constantly communicate ideas, but stop nagging him. He gets it already. And naggers are just, I got to tell you, nagging is, it's all right, it's okay. It's just do it this way. Come on, you can do it. That's nagging. For a cleric, say, okay, we're going to go from point A to point B. Are you ready? Go. And then let him do it. And if he guides off, if he starts to go off the wrong direction, guide him back gently and make it his idea. It works great. Sanguines, on the other hand, you just have to make fun. You know, they go out on a blustery day with the wind blowing, goats up in the tail. They start dancing up and down the end of the rope. Laugh with them. They're just having fun. A cleric is going to say, okay, I'm going to brace. There's some cold out there, and I'm going to just go out there because I know that's what I'm supposed to do. It's kind of cool. Melancholics, be organized. Stick to the plan. Be proactive. If anything changes, like the bird suddenly flies up, stick to the plan or adapt and maintain your direction. These guys follow orders well and are focused, but be clear and detailed. Vagueness does not work. So when you go out with a melancholy horse, you have to know what you're doing. You can't just say, okay, whatever you want to do, because melancholies are not good leaders. They need a plan. And if you're, if you're ahead of them, if you're proactive in this case, the horse will do everything you want to do, and then you give them praise. You did it great. We're going to add to your list tomorrow, and that's how you train a melancholy. Now, the phlegmatic, remain the rock of confidence he needs. Never sway. Be the decision maker. He will always forgive you, and he will save your butt when you get into trouble. These horses become the bomb-proof ones only if they are loyal and treated fairly. So phlegmatics, don't holler at them. Just lead them, and they'll be fine. Okay, I told you I'd use a human example, and here it is. An employee walks into your place of business, 
and you can tell she has an attitude. She barely says good morning. She starts slamming things around and won't make eye contact. The tone of the office is very quiet and cold. Okay, what do you do? We've got a person who's coming in and she's got an attitude. She's got a story, all right? And a lot of people would go up to her and say, geez, what happened to you last night? And then she goes into the story, and of course, you say, oh, gosh, that's awful. I would kick his butt and blah, 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 or that's not what I would do. This is what I would have done, and they start giving advice, and you bought into the story. And as soon as you buy into the story, you've lost your leadership. So what you need to do is acknowledge your actions. Sue, I see that this day has already started off badly for you. I just wanted to let you know that I know, how, I know you feel this way, and that I will do everything I can to help you through it. So here you reflected back to her and that you're listening. You're seeking first to understand. You've acknowledged that something's going on and she's made herself well known in the office. And you say, I'm going to help you through this, but I'm not going to let it affect the rest of my office because we have a goal here. We have a plan to, do, to, to work. So second, keep your energy and your leadership in focus. After she says to you, you bet this is a bad day, you need to say, I can feel you're upset, but this is my place of business, and you need to check your attitude. This is what I do when I walk in a horse. When a horse starts to tell me a story and he's got an attitude with me, I say, that's fine. That's great. I appreciate that. But I'm here to float your horses, your teeth, and we're going to work together, and we're going to get it done. I'm going to take the pain away from your mouth. Are you ready to get started? I just don't buy into the story. I listen to it. I acknowledge it. I let him know that it's there, but I say I'm not going to buy into it. I basically say I will help you in any way I can, but I will not enable you to suffer through this day here. Are we clear? I've got your back, and I care for you. Do you understand me? So you've acknowledged the person. You haven't dismissed them. You haven't told them they're an idiot. You haven't told them that, geez, if you had your life in order, this wouldn't be a problem or anything else. You just basically acknowledge them. And you haven't accepted it. You have established your leadership and you have prepared the way to have your wants and needs be heard and understood. So if this person is a cleric, remind her how awesome she is at her job and how much she means to the operation of the business. Remind her of how grateful you are to have her and why. This will bolster her ego and she will immediately refocus on her tasks because she has been reminded of her position. Anything less is showing her weakness, and cleric personalities don't like to be seen as weak. Immediately give her a goal and watch her go for it. Cleric personalities love goals, but don't like to be told how to do them. Same with a horse. If you've got a cleric horse and he's having an attitude, give him something to do. Let him say, you know what? This may be a bad day for you, but we need to get this job done. What do you say? And they'll do great for you. <clears throat> If this girl in the office, Sue, is a melancholy, remind her that it is because of her incredible ability to focus on the tasks of the business, the business succeeds. Immediately offer her tasks to perform that will take her mind off of her worries and onto the tasks given. Melancholies love tasks and do, with, do them without knowing the reason or the goal. So if you have a horse that's going down the, the, the road and all of a sudden birds fly up, give the horse another task. Let's go this way. Let's break into a trot. Let's uh, see how all the other horses do it. Let's move into the group of horses, whatever it is. Give the horses specific tasks to focus on, and it'll take their attention off the thing that wasn't on their list. <clears throat> For a sanguine horse, first, above all, tell her how beautiful she looks today. <clears throat> Even if it's a lie, she will love it. Then tell Sue... <clears throat> all the good things that are in her life and how grateful you are for having her in your life. You bring life to this business. You light up the room. You are the wind beneath the wings of this business. In other words, flip on the spotlight and swing the beam directly on her. Then watch her glow. They will escalate their antics unless you change the script and scenery. Make them laugh and then change your focus. That's what you do with a sanguine horse. The horse is rearing up. He's you know pawing in the air as you're trying to lead him out on that cold morning. Okay, so he's doing that. Just say, okay, he's doing that. Don't escalate your energy. Don't acknowledge their story. Just move on and say, okay, we're going to go over here and start the horse walking. Change your focus. Laugh with them. Say, man, it's a cold day out here. I feel like doing that. And keep walking because your energy will stay low and the horse will stick right with you. 
<clears throat> Break your state of a sanguine. Refocus the sanguine's horse of mind is one of the secrets to working them. The other is never reward their bad behavior. That's what people do. The horse is rearing up and they jerk on the chain. They tell them how bad they are. Get down or I'm going to send you to the glue factory, on and on and on. And that just feeds into it. This is actually true for every horse you meet, but particularly important for the sanguine horses. <clears throat> the sanguine horse loves the performance just like any actor. And any time a spotlight is cast upon them, good or bad, they will only want to act dance, and sing more. If the gal in the office is, is a phlegmatic, these people and horses usually aren't flushing about anything. They won't come into the office slamming doors. The horse won't show you how much reaction when you enter the store. Phlegmatic stall. Phlegmatic horses are usually compliant and easygoing. Remember, everyone is a mix of personalities, but the predominant phlegmatic won't show their other personalities until provoked. This sometimes happens when the horse is pushed past the comfort point. Always pay 100% attention to all horses, especially phlegmatics. <clears throat> if a phlegmatic person comes into your office, slams the door, and slams things down, they have been pushed beyond their limits, and you need to give them comfort and security and reassurance that you're the leader and they will follow you. So the most important thing to remember in horsemanship and communication is that it takes two to communicate. The essential parts are listening deeply by acknowledging what is said. If you're there to do something such as float the horse, then you can do so only after the horse has been heard and acknowledged. Only then will the horse be listening to you, seeking to understand what you want. All right, I'm on Law 9 and Law 10, and I've got just a little bit more to go because these, uh, this won't take too much time. But this is culminating in two very important things. Energy is everything. Never exceed the energy of the horse. Leadership never comes from a higher level of energy. Now, if you look at energy as water, water always seeks the lowest level. That's just how it works. And if you can get your energy to drop down to the lowest level, Everyone around you, horses and people, will drop down to that lowest energy. It's a, it's a law of nature. You can't get away from it. An irrefutable law is like gravity. It doesn't go away. If you just relax and let your energy go down, the horse will drop down to you. In fact, this is really key. If you're going to work with horses, learn how to control your own energy. Stop working on the horse. Stop trying to make the horse calm down. Stop trying to change the horse. You cannot do it. You cannot change your spouse. You cannot change your um, parents. You can't change the people around you, your boss. You can't change them. The only thing that you can change is yourself. And start with your energy. Get your energy low, and everybody around you will come down to your energy. And don't confuse excitement with a high energy level. There's tons of excitement. We all get excited, just like kids in, you know, the first day of school. We're all excited. We might be confused, you know. We might be, you know, worried, all these things. If your energy stays low, all that will just come right down. So what happens when a horse challenges that, <clears throat> that your authority? Well, sorry about that. It challenges your authority. The result is dependent upon your reaction to the horse's elevated energy. That's the secret. If you surrender the leadership role to the horse and he becomes the boss, he will go ahead and eat all day and you'll go in the house either wondering why you're wasting your money or worse, you're in an ambulance. You surrendered your role of leadership and the horse has run roughshod over you. Result number two is no one surrenders the leadership. The horse raises his energy and you raise your energy to match. Then when you when then you up the energy level, and the horse does the same. This is what I call a crescendo. That's a term that's used in music, meaning the, the music grows louder. And you hate that. Whenever a crescendo occurs and the horse keeps matching your energy and raises it beyond it, you're never, ever, ever going to have a good result. And then result number three, you remain the leader. If the leadership comes from low energy level, from confidence, then as a leader, you cannot raise your energy to the level of the horse. When your horse starts to scream, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, a leader does not look at the sky. He does not crescendo. The leader only sees where the leader wants to be and leads the followers to that place. When you feel energy levels rising, consciously bring your energy levels down. 
that's what you need to practice on. When you get done with this and, and move on with the rest of your life, you know, tomorrow as you go to back to work or you're hanging around other people, try to lower your energy around all the people and watch what happens. It is really amazing. You'll walk into a, a, your place of work or you'll walk into the breakfast room with your family and there's chaos. You keep your energy very low and watch what all these people do. I'm not saying ignore the people around you. Make aware that they're there. Acknowledge them. But keep your energy low and watch everybody just try to follow you and do what you do. It is mind-blowing. Learn to relax and control your own energy. You can never control anyone else's energy. You just can't. If you want to become a good horseman, focus on yourself and no one else. Dump all stories you have of actors on TV or parents or friends reacting to drama. TV has escalated our drama in, in raising our energy. We see fights all the time. We see people screaming at each other. We see people listening to everybody else's story. And we think these actors are training us to become good people. They're not. Acting is acting. This is real life, you and me and our horses. This is real life. Go the opposite way. Stay calm, stay cool. Look at um, Clint Eastwood when he says, go ahead, make my day. He remained calm. And all the bad guys looked at him and said, oh, I better just drop my gun and turn around and cuff me. That's all they did. That's what we want to do with these horses. Create a story in your mind where your energy seeks the lowest level with any excess draining out of the bottoms of your feet into the earth. Gone for good. Practice this every day. When a driver cuts you off, dump the energy welling up inside of you. I am personally not good at that. i got to be honest with you. Somebody cuts me off, and my wife uh, will laugh at me. Jeez, no drama there, huh, Doc? But uh, it's, it's hard, we, especially in the car, when we can't see the other person. We just need to explode sometimes. But try practicing this tomorrow on your way to work. When you're driving, somebody cuts you off or does something dumb, Dump the energy that you feel welling up. Just the fact that you're aware of the energy welling up inside of you and consciously dumping it will make you such an amazing person, an amazing horse person. Anyone can raise your energy. Learn to diminish it or eliminate it. It's hard to do with familiar people who have pushed your button, but try anyway. What I mean by that is the people closest to you know how to push your buttons and they'll push them. Learn how to not let that happen. So, <clears throat> do all the following and witness the results. First, number one, dump your excess energy. Two, seek first to understand and continue to check your energy. It's an ongoing thing. You just can't do it once. You have to keep dumping it. Three, don't accept their story. Remain the leader. Four, don't reward bad behavior ever. Complete communication by expressing your calm thoughts using your, your knowledge of their personality. Be fair, clear in your direction, and honest, continue to check your energy. Yes, this works with people. That's my point. If you can do this with people, you can do it with horses. There's a reason so many people are poor horsemen, because they are poor uh, communicators with people. Practice every day with every person you come in contact with. You'll become a better horseman. And it's fun to witness the changes you brought because you changed you. In time, this will become effortless. Finally, the last law is 10, a horse is a horse. This law is so important to understand and is easily applied no matter what your personality is. Yet in my experience, this simple thought seems so elusive because people live in a complex world. People become confused between the emotion they have being with horses and the fact that it is the connection with the horse that brings the joy, not the physical horse. Nurturing the connection of who we are not who we think the horse should be is fundamental. Don't try to change him into something he can never be. Your horse is not a surrogate child, a surrogate spouse, therapy for your problems at work, your friend you cannot find in the people world, a cow, a dog, a cat, or any other animal. Take the horse for what he is, an individual living being with certain needs and desires unique to that horse. When I walk into a stall, I'm very clear with the horse. I'm a human, and he is a horse. To open up the dialogue, that leads to communication. I offer my presence as an equal being using the common language of respect. For me, to offer him a brochure on the floating process before I start floating would be ridiculous. Even if he could read it, 
he would not understand the idea. But a horse understands respect and a willingness of a human to first seek to understand their position and then to explain what we're doing. Respect is everything. I've been told that the only one I can change is me. I think this is the basis for Law 10. A horse is nothing but a horse, and for us to turn him into something else is disrespectful to the horse. I know you don't like to be called a female dog, do you? A mule, a slave, or anything but a human? It's disrespectful. Not all people want to be your friend, but all people want respect and to be treated fairly. Horses want this too. This applies to the way we feed them. Feed them like a horse. Don't feed them like a person. Don't feed them because somebody told you to feed them this way. Learn how to feed them correctly. Listen to last month's webinar. Find out how to feed horses. Work with them, talk with them, and care for them. Treat them as an individual being, and you will be miles ahead in your quest to become a horseman. And stop calling them names like stupid, killer, and the like. Hey, I don't call you, you, you blonde, therefore you're dumb. Stop assigning names. Oh, he's, he's crazy. He's a thoroughbred. How disrespectful to that horse. He's crazy because you're overfeeding him on grain and you're not respecting him. That's why he's crazy. It's not because he's a thoroughbred. Thoroughbreds happen to be one of the most communicative horses out there. They love to communicate. That's what makes him so interesting. And stop assuming that, okay, I just went over there, a certain breed or color. These are all stories inside your head, and you're preventing you from becoming good horsemen. Dump your stories. Replace it with a story such as, I'm going to respect the horse. I'm going to treat him as a horse. I'm going to listen first. Then I'm going to get my point across. I'm going to constantly lower my energy. Get those stories straight. So let's do take-home points. There are 10 laws, four are physical and six are mental. All are there to develop a two-way communication. Stop rewarding bad behavior. Start working on yourself and treat all horses with respect. You go to the equinepractice.com and click on the store and scroll down the page. You'll see this picture on the right-hand side. It's the 10 Irrefutable Laws of Horsemanship. Paperback is 15 bucks. Ebook from the publisher is 5 dollars and if you go to iBooks from iTunes, it's $5.99. I think I make about 50 cents on each one of them. The rest of them go to the publisher. But I'll tell you what, if you don't like it, you send the book back to me and ask for your money back. Because I'm telling you what, this is everything I do. When I work with the tens of thousands of horses that I do, the thousands of them every year, year after year since 1973, this is what has me walk in 93% of the time and work with horses floating their teeth without drugs. All right, we have used up an hour and three minutes, and now I'm open to any questions, if you have any. I'm gonna flip over to um, this page. Let's see if we have any questions here. A lot of people wish me happy uh, new year, and I just appreciate that so much. 2016 is gonna be such an awesome year for everybody, because um, it's going to be the year that for a lot of people, it's going to be changed. You're sitting here listening, trying to learn uh, from somebody. I think it's awesome. I'm so glad that you're all here. So, okay. How can we find out what our horse's personality is? That's um, there, that, For humans, there's a book called uh, Personality Plus by Florence Lidauer. I don't have that written here. Um, Actually, uh, personality plus P E R S O N A L I T Y P L U S, um, and the author is Florence Litauer L I T T A U E R, I believe. Uh, there, I just posted on the chat room. Um, it's also in the back of the book. I give her credit because she talks about the Socrates personalities: the phlegmatic, uh, melancholy, cleric, and sanguine. Uh, and that's and they have a test that you can take to determine what personality you are. Um, it just takes work with a lot of horses to find out if um, you can understand them. But just get the book, read uh, the different personalities, and then look at the horse. Remember, we're all blends. And I will tell you, the ideal person is 25% of all four. They're balanced right across. They don't get upset about a lot of things. They're naturally confident. Um, they like to make make sure that everything's in order, they have some sort of order in their life, their room isn't just a mess and in chaos, 
Um, and they like to have fun. They don't mind going out and having a, you know, a good time with some friends. That's what um, a good uh, balanced person is. But horses and people usually aren't balanced. They're predominantly one. If you get Florence's uh, book, The Personality Plus, and take that test and learn and understand these personalities, you'll be able to understand the people, uh, pardon me, the horses, and you'll start to recognize this, especially if you get to work with multiple horses. If you only have one or two horses in your barn, uh, it's a little bit more difficult. But I will tell you, Melissa and I often go into a barn and say, um, we just start describing the per horse's personality. We've never seen the horse. We've never met the owner. And yet within a couple of minutes, we're telling people exactly what type of horse this is. And the people are blown away. They say, oh, my gosh, how did you know that? How did you do that? I mean, I don't get it. Um, and, uh, and it's kind of funny because you can become that good too. It just takes practice. Everything I talked about today takes practice. And if you're willing to put the work into it, you're going to be an amazing horseman. Read every book you can on leadership. Um, the whole book, The Ten Irrefutable Laws of Horsemanship, was a, a ripoff of a book called uh, The Ten Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Ma Maxwell. Uh, Oops, A-X-W-E-L-L, -L. Um, 10 irrefutable Q -E -B -L -E laws of leadership. There we go. So that's, I just posted up there, the 10 it starts with the word the, 10 irrefutable laws of leadership. And, uh, and the seek first to understand, then to be understood was taken from Stephen Covey's uh, seven habits of highly effective people uh, and that's also another good book seven habits of highly effective people the one thing that we um, need to know and, and the takeaway is to become a good leader work on yourself when you work on yourself and you become a leader and you can start affecting the people around you, you'll start affecting the horses around you. It goes hand in hand. It's just that simple. Uh, Marilyn says, I agree uh, about the blend of the four personalities with some dominant. That is true. Um, also feel percent of each change over time and with experience uh, training. Um, that's true. Uh, you'll see an improvement. What's really cool is if you work with these horses, um, I've had some horses I can't work with without just drugging them. They're, they're so afraid. They've had such a bad history, bad story, that not only do they need sedatives and painkillers, they also need the anxiolytic called Valium. And these horses cannot be floated without just this chemical reassurance that I'm not going to hurt them. And it takes about a year and a half to two and a half years of doing this every six months. But as we get out there, they see me come and they say, wait a minute. I remember you, I trust you, and I'm going to behave for you. And these horses actually become better, mainly because they say, I remember you, and you listen to me. I see this all the time. Oh, you're going to hurt. Oh, wait. No, wait. I remember you from last time. You remembered that that part bothered me. I'm going to work with you because you have listened to me and you understand me. This happens all the time. And with training, all you have to do is let the horse know that you're listening. And once you've got that connection, then ask them what you want to do. And they will listen to you. It's a two-way communication. Works with people, too. I've uh, been doing this a long time, and i got to tell you, I'm flat out excited that you guys are all here, and you're, and you're going to learn this. And everybody else who's listening to this later on, um, you're going to love it, too. Um, anybody else have any more questions? Um, I probably blew you, some of you out of the water. Um, it's not what you've been hearing. There's no fancy gimmicks. There's no uh, tricks. There's no uh, training aids. This basically, if you want to become a horseman, it's an inside job. And that's the difference between me and, and these other people. You have to learn to become the best you can be. Uh, you're welcome, Abby. Um, I love this. I, I love teaching, and uh, I hope more and more people. And, and listen, when you get this link, feel free to hand it around and send it to some people. Say, hey, listen to this guy or buy this book um, because it's going to make a difference. All right. Anything else? 
and Kay. Have a great 2016. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all next uh, first Sunday of the month, um, February, whatever that is. And uh, um, I, I can't even remember what the subject is, but y'all get it. You'll all find out what it is. I sent out the newsletter and I hope you all join me then. So good night, everyone.